Thank you. Wow. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for all being here today. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank again Eileen. I know it's a really busy day, so appreciate you for kicking it off. Uh, Beth, I know you're not here. With, you're with her, your father, but thank you for opening up the conversations to us. We really, uh, it really helped me with my journey. And Julie and uh, Anna, you guys recommended me for this forum, so really appreciate that. And then last but not least, Amy, Chernouche, and Cheryl, I know who's on the phone, thanks for prepping me in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's, they, they've had a, they had a big job in front of them. And I just want to introduce my family. Thank you all for being here today. Um, it happens to be spring break. Um, <laughs> and so we had always, always planned for them to visit Cincinnati from Maine. Uh, my, brother and his husband Michael, but uh, this is perfect for them to kind of see the world that I live in. So Josh, my husband, Olivia, my daughter, Sam, my son, and then of course um, Victor and Michael. Thanks for being here. It is an honor to be part of this conversation, um, this really important GE Aviation initiative. And um, you know, as Eileen said, I'm the HR business partner for aviation. I've been with aviation for a year and a half and GE for a little bit under eight years. Um, and as an HR business partner, I feel that we truly contribute to many things. But for me, I feel that I'm at my best when I'm able to connect people to people, people to ideas and people to purpose. And this has been a recurring theme for me in this career that found me. And so for that, I'm extremely proud to be a part of this aviation business. Today, I'm here to share with you some lessons learned um, and the challenges that I faced. And I think the story is really about choices, uh, making the choice, sorry, making the choice to, uh, to have courage, having the choice to reinvent myself when I needed to and to face into the challenges. And in my darkest moments, um, I believe that I had that choice to, to be a better version of me than I was the day before. Um, so that's what I wanted to share with you and you know, uh, it's okay because you know all of those choices that I made has is what led me to GE and led me to GE Aviation um, And really it's okay because um, there's a happy ending to that story because you see me standing here So but <laughs> what I want to share with you may be a little bit difficult um, for me Maybe not for you, but you know bear with me. I really appreciate that patience uh, so, if you don't mind, let me rewind a little bit back to my childhood. I was made in Taiwan. <laughs> it's like 50-50. Half the people get it, the other half are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, which is located in Eastern Asia. Um, and so I was uh, born a preemie um, on a leap day. And that maybe explains my height. Um, <clears throat> and I spent a lot of time in the, in the hospital early on. Um, unfortunately, my mother passed away about a week before I turned three, and uh, she was battling diabetes, and she was going through um, dialysis mul multiple times a week. And so, but bef before she passed away, she, um, uh, you know, she put me in an orphanage, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit, but I, I have no memories of her. I, I don't know what she looks like other than maybe four or five photos that I have of her. I don't know what she sounds like, so I wish we had recordings these days. Um, and in fact, my first memory ever was of her funeral. So up until three years ago when people would say, I'm sorry for your loss, I would always say thank you. But in the back of my mind, I always thought, how do you miss something you never had? And that's how it was until about three years ago. So as I mentioned, my mother put me in an orphan orphanage um, before she passed. She told them I had no family and that I believe she hoped for a better life for me. Um, with the system. And I know this because I have a 15-page journal that she wrote in the hospital that I have today. After she passed, I was taken out of the orphanage, bounced around a bit, and ultimately lived with my grandparents on my father's side. My father was remarried almost um, pretty quickly within the year, but I didn't live with them. Um, it was made very clear to me by my family, and particularly my grandfather, that I was a unwanted girl who belonged nowhere and to no one. Um, I was often abused, um, neglected, and laughed at, um, and you know, punished for things that really didn't understand why I was being punished, to the degree that the little four or five-year-old of me wished I had this magical bracelet. I never got the bracelet, but this bracelet would be like a light indicator, you know, like a green and red stop, because somebody was going to be upset. One of your family members was 
going to be in a bad mood, and it would warn me before I walked in the door. And so I, I wished I had this bracelet because I would get into trouble for things that I didn't understand. Um, when I was, um, when I turned seven, I was uh, finally able to live with my parents. That's my graduation photo. And I was really excited about that. You know, here I, here's an opportunity for me to be a part of something, to belong somewhere, and to be with family. But that wasn't the case. Um, I was often left alone to fend for myself, alone in the apartments, alone on public play playgrounds, alone on public transportation. It was never safe to be on public transportation in Taiwan. But I, I fended for myself. Um, and I remember one night, I was asleep in the middle of the night, dead silence, and there was a cockroach crawling up my leg, and it terrified me. I was a little bit shorter than I am today, and <laughs> this thing was at least two inches. I don't know, with you know, arms and legs, and I knew it was going to kill me. I knew it was going like, to, I, I was going to be dead. And it was in that moment that I, you know, I screamed and called for help because you know, this thing was going to kill me. And I remember yelling out and screaming for help, but for how long, I don't know, but no one came. And as I yelled into the night and screamed into the night, um, I even hoped that maybe neighbors would check in on me, as they had before, but no one came. Um, and I think it was in that moment that I felt, you know, I don't know who these people are. I don't know what I'm dealing with here, but I do know that I'm going to have to trust myself, and it was, I was going to have to count on me. And so I did. I took it out of the roach. It deserved um, to be alive as I did, so I didn't want to kill it. I just didn't want it to kill me. So I, <laughs> I flicked it. That's what I did. It was very brave. Um, I flicked it, and it, like, I don't know, crawled off into the corner and out the window or something. But it, it had a really um, impactful moment on me because it was that moment that I found courage, and it was in that moment that I realized I could rely on myself and trust my instincts, and I longer, no longer needed that bracelet anymore, um, the magical bracelet. I did continue to live with my parents for another two years, and um, when I turned nine, oh, so when I turned nine, these, the timeline here, um, I was, my, my parents decided that I needed to leave. So it was just a couple of years of, of that, and I needed to leave to be adopted by my aunt who is my birth mother's sister. It was both terrifying and exciting at the same time. Terrifying because I spoke no English at all. Um, and I didn't really know my aunt. And, um, but exciting because I thought, here it is. Now is the chance. I get a chance to be with family because it's my mother's side. Here's a chance for me to have a brother. He, you know, she had a teenage son, Victor. And I thought, OK, perhaps this is an opportunity to start a new chapter. But. I'll talk a little bit about that journey. But before we um, came to America, I remember being on a long distance phone call, you know, the kind that you yell into because you're talking the distance. And I remember asking her, hey, what's my name going to sound like in English? And she said, Ji Miao Chen. And I thought, say that again? That's not going to work because I'm a third grader and I know third graders and that they were just going to, you know, run behind me going meow, 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 meow. I thought. <laughs> So we're going to have a fresh start. Let's do this right. Um, and I said, can I change that? Is there any way I can make it, make it something different? And she said, sure, you can write whatever you want on the piece of paper. I thought, OK, how about Maria? You know, from Sesame Street, right? <laughs> Thank you. I mean, we all wanted to be Maria. And so that was my chance to be Maria. I didn't get the memo for a middle name, so I just Maria was my name. So with my name settled, I came to the state. Big hopes. I probably had a little bag with a couple of outfits in it. And that was it. Um, and you know, met Victor, and uh, by the way, standing here. And you know, from the very beginning, early in, in the journey, I realized that my aunt had a big heart because she didn't have to adopt me or bring me over, but she also had a sharp mouth and a very broken mind. Um, she was very abusive to us both, and it was just something that we're kind of working through. And I remember she she constantly threatened me. If I didn't listen, if I didn't do the right thing, if I misbehaved, that it was one phone call and I would be deported and gone. And so it always lived under the, kind of that threat of, of losing everything in a moment. And I almost wish for that bracelet back, you know, the magical bracelet that I never had. Um, we moved around quite a bit. We went from 
Arkansas, oh yeah, I learned English in Arkansas. <laughs> I mean, I love Arkansas. Uh, learned English in Arkansas, we moved to California, and then we moved to Georgia and a couple of places, and we finally settled in Duluth, Georgia. And Duluth is where I started middle school. I found um, my passion for music. I was playing the violin, and I met my best friend, Brianne, and we um, you know, kind of had a sort of a childhood. Um, but when I was in the eighth or ninth grade, I remember my aunt kind of calling me over to the dining room table and, to have a talk. And so I thought, okay, it started out pretty gentle. You know, how's it going? How's life? How's school? And I thought we were having a nice conversation. And then things turned kind of quickly. I don't know when, but she started to pepper me with questions. Um, you know, about lipstick and about being on the phone too long and some boyfriend and having friends down the street and all of a sudden it just escalated and she pulled out something from next to her that I hadn't noticed before and in it was my passport, my green card, and my birth certificate. And she then pulled it out, she put it in this metal bowl that was also on the table that I hadn't noticed before and then she put it in there and she lit a fire to it. She lit a match. And so like, we have a fire in the living room. So my first reaction was put out this fire and I reached my arms out to put out the fire and she grabbed it and she bit me really hard. And so I was shocked because we had a fire in the living room and then I was double shocked that, that, that she bit me and got up and I ran out the house. Um, I don't know if I even had shoes on. I, I'm not sure if I was out on my own with no one to go to and no one to call for hours or it couldn't have been days. But I just remember being in the back of a police car and I remember being at ER, being at the ER so they can mend my wound and they asked me if I wanted to press charges. I said no. And then I remember ultimately ending up at um, my best friend Brianne's family's home, the Metzger's. So the Metzgers, this is my best friend, you know, for a couple of years, they barely knew me. And I don't know what happened behind closed doors, but all I know is that they decided to keep me. They could have just passed me on to the system and take me back to the police station, but they didn't. And they brought, in, it brought me in. And they treated me like one of them. I'm talking vacations, I'm talking Easter egg hunts, you know, the little golden Easter the, like, eggs so that you can get teenagers to participate, like all of that, because <laughs> there was money in it. And in my, my best friend even shared her room with me, I mean, a teenager sharing a room with another friend, that's amazing. And never once did I ever felt unwelcome or unsafe. And so for a couple of years that I stayed with them, I had a childhood and they gave that to me. Um, they even helped me with my citizenship. So getting my citizenship, so I am forever grateful. And up until this moment, you know, there were people in my life that maybe should have or could have cared about me, but didn't or couldn't. And then people like the Metzgers where they could have just walked on by and the kindness and the compassion that they gave me completely changed my life. And, and I'm forever gr grateful for that to the point that even a couple of months ago, I called them again and I said, hey, I've always wanted to pay you back, you know, and, Sarah said, Maria, we didn't do that because we want your payback. We did it because we love you. And I thought, <laughs> random people, right? <laughs> <laughs> that you can find kindness and compassion through. And so that's what I've started to do is treat everything in that way and, and be that compassionate, kind person because I hope one day that I can have an impact on someone the way that they did for me. So by the time I was 15, I was holding two jobs. The Hussmakers, which is a violin shop, was one of them. I was the first non-Hussmaker, so very proud of that. Um, and I had graduated from high school um, with my violin scholarship. I got into Georgia State University and I was pursuing a, um, a music major. Everything was great, I knew my path. And then one day at the Hussmakers shop, they weren't there, they had a family emergency. Um, there was a very patient customer who waited until all the customers were done and I was helping him and his son and we started to talk and you know chit chat and then I found out that he was doing this thing called HR. HR, what is that? And he told me a little bit more about it and I asked him more questions, you know, the ones, the people that know me. 
If, you know, what is it? What do you like about it? You know, what's a good day in life like? You know, why do you like it? Yada, yada, yada. And finally, at some point, he was like, just try it. <laughs> and so um, you know, what he talked about in terms of connecting his role was to connect people to people and people to careers and have an impact on business from an HR perspective. And everything he said really resonated with me. And so that's when I decided, you know what? I had I'd chosen this path for music because it was a passion, but maybe I'll put that aside for a little bit and, and look after, you know, go after this new passion, possibly, this HR thing. And so I started this HR internship with Georgia Pacific. Fast forward seven years later, I'd gone through the leadership program, supply chain, union, non-union shops, paper mills, startups, shutdowns. I mean, it was just a fantastic sort of HR foundation that I was built, or that was built with me, and that's how HR found me. So um, real quick, just you know, fun fact. So these choices, remember when I told you that I chose my name, Maria, because of Sesame Street? Well, after I graduated from high school, before I started college, I took a trip back to Taiwan for the first time after nine years, and I was standing in front of my mother's grave, and on it I'm reading, and it said, Christian name, Maria. And I'm like, What is this? I go back to my parents' house and I asked my dad, I said, did you know that my birth mom's name is Maria? Maria? He goes, oh yeah, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> so, hey, you know what? Um, but at that point in time, choices, you know, they have consequences, but they also have really surprising sweet endings like that. And it's just as special to me now that I picked it as if my mother was alive to pick it for me. While I was in college, during, the high, during the, the, those years, I also met a wonderful guy named Josh. <laughs> we had our 12th anniversary the other day. He's like, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> so we got graduated. We graduated and we got married. And then within a couple of years, our son was born. Um, and in 2011, while I was at, in Savannah, Georgia Pacific, I got a phone call from GE, Digital Energy. Um, for a site and you know, leadership role at SummerSource, New Hampshire, and it's a smart meters and instrument transformer business, about 500 people, uh, non-union shop, going through a lot of change. I didn't really research what country SummerSource was in, uh, just dove right in because I knew the brand, I knew the GE you know, um, uh, brand that's out in the market. And fortunately, Josh was also uh, open to life's fun events or fun adventures. Um, Sam eventually got to like the snow after this little photo here. And so we, <laughs> I didn't see what he did, but okay. And as I think back, um, Summersworth was the best place for me to start my GE career. It was rich in GE history, filled with just wonderful people, many of whom I'm still in touch with today. We did a lot of tough things like competitive wage and um, transfer of work, and but we also had fun, you know, doing stuff like. Oh, well, next. We also had fun um, working on things like, uh, you know, saving a moose and and rescuing beavers, <laughs> and that's also where Olivia was born. So it has a special place in my heart, and it's the reason why I still have a 603 number. <laughs> so after about three years in New Hampshire, a couple of snowstorms and all of that, we did uh, move back to Atlanta for a role with Digital Energy Commercial Sales Organizations in HR. And so I did that a little bit, and then I moved over to organization talent and development where we worked on the Ulstom integration. So if you may or may not remember, Digital Energy had about 3,000 employees. We acquired 20,000 employees, Ulstom Grid. We had about 30 HR folks. We acquired 200 Ulstom HR folks that were trying to figure out what does GE stand for kind of thing. And it was really hard and really challenging, but a lot of fun. And I think it was in those years that really started to refine who I was as an HR professional, how do I add value, what is my purpose, and I realized that I was really good at connecting the disconnected and um, helping the unseen be seen. I was really happy about that. Everything seemed to be going really well for me at this point. I had a wonderful husband who's incredibly patient with me and you know, really healthy children and who could, would have asked for more? But I was looking for more and I was, uh, I don't know, always chasing for validation, I was still chasing to matter and chasing to belong. And I didn't realize kind of how my past has had an impact on me until one day when Olivia was three years old or almost three 
And on this day, I truly felt like a failure as a mother. I mean, we were standing in a closet and she just refused to put on these really awesome purple shoes, <laughs> sparkly shoes that I just bought her for her and they were really awesome. I wish they had been my size. And she just fought me on everything and I just couldn't understand, what is this? What happened to the beautiful mother-daughter relationship that I always wanted? And I was starting to take it personally because it must be me and I'm doing something wrong and she doesn't like me and all these thoughts went through my mind. And then I started to reflect and I said, and I thought and I remembered, I've been treating her like I've been treating everything in my life at that point, like a project to finish, a project to maintain, something to accomplish, a checklist, you know, something to be, to perfect. And, and I was treating her as if a checklist. Um, and, and, you know, the entire time I wanted to kind of make things perfect so that I can show other people I'm not what you said I was, and not just other people, my family. I'm not what you said I was and am because I can make her and this better than, than you think and you thought that I was going to be. And, you know, all this chasing for belonging and chasing for validation, I, I was just always under the constant fear that this would disappear any moment, just that it had multiple times in my life. And that suddenly Josh would, you know, go away and the kids would get sick and, and things would just come crashing down and be taken from me, or that even if it stayed, that I, somehow I didn't deserve it anyway. And so that was really not good. I was just surviving still, even, despite all of that. And then I realized, remember when I told you, when people said, sorry for your loss, and I said, how do you miss something you never had? Well, I have it. I just didn't realize it. Moments of belonging, moments of joy was <laughs> happening right in front of me, but I just, I wasn't even present to kind of feel it and see it. Other people saw it, but I didn't, and I was missing out on it. And in fact, it really dawned on me that I didn't want them to miss out on a mother the way that I did, and that was devastating. And I knew I had to change. I didn't know what that meant. I had to become a better mother, better friend, better daughter or sister in a way that, that, that they deserved, but I didn't know if I had the tools and skill sets to do it, but I made a decision I was going to, and so I started on that journey. Um, and, you know, they didn't need me to be their project manager or perfecter or anything like that. They just needed me to be me, just as I don't care if my mother was a successful anything. I just just to have one more minute with her, to remember her voice is all I needed. And so that's what really changed um, kind of my mindset. And by the way, Josh was always ahead of me already and always two steps ahead of me because a couple of Christmases ago before the purple shoe incident, he had bought me this grape soda pin. So for those of you that may or may not know um, the Pixar Up movie, where Carl gave, um, or Ellie gave Carl the little purple pin and she said, you're in my club now. I had been in his club for almost 10 years. I didn't appreciate it. So, sorry, this is on my bedside every day so I can remember what we have. It's a small pen, but it matters a great deal. So that was three years ago, and I went to go see a counselor. You know, I'm HR, I like tell everybody to go see a counselor. <laughs> <laughs> but I did try it for myself that through EAP. Um, and I started to kind of dig into my past in a way that I never had before. Um, and I opened up to a few friends. And, you know, I just want to share with you my first counseling session. Um, I sat down. I was like, hey, um, I know I get six free sessions for this. So I'm a quick learner. I work hard. I'm going to do all my homework. I'm going to do all my homework. So I'm thinking maybe we'll be done in four sessions, maybe? This therapist, she laughed at me. And then she's like, OK, we got ways to go. So it's been three years since the purple shoe incident. Um, and you know, in a way, I haven't really changed who I am at my core. I'm still talkative, still cheerful, still energetic, optimistic. Um, and I still give 150% to everything that I do, but I now do those things with a different purpose and a different intention. Instead of proving people wrong, those behaviors, I was doing it because it was either the right thing to do that was gonna make me a better person or help the person that I was deal working with make them better and help them see maybe what they didn't see before. And so um, when GE called, 
It was a totally different conversation this time. I knew about GE Aviation, or sorry, when GE Aviation called, because I was already part of GE, I was, you know, it, it wasn't a trophy that I was chasing after this time. I mean, everyone wanted to be part of a winning team. I wanted to be part of a winning team and a winning culture. But I knew this time, it wasn't the job title that I could show off to someone else that I matter. It wasn't even the small office space that I have to say, hey, I'm a big deal. It was truly about the purpose and the reason and what we do here in GE Aviation. I mean, my brother-in-law is in the military and he, not this one, a different one, um, and you know, he was uh, deployed multiple times to Afghanistan and it's, I really connected with that purpose and for the first time I thought, you know what, I'm gonna learn from GE Aviation, absolutely. It's gonna make me better, but at the same time with my personality and you know, my supply chain background, my integration background, all of that, I can add value pretty quickly too. And it felt like a mutual ground versus me chasing after something um, you know, like a trophy. And so it was a, aviation a year and a half ago was really a perfect formula for me to kind of test out my new self um, and, and do some of the things with courage and with confidence in a way that I'd never had before. And you know, like most people, I'm sure, most days I still triple, double, quadruple doubt myself and, and you know, wonder if I'm worth it and if I'm doing a good job. But most days I think, you know, what happened to me doesn't define me. And I love Lauren Tubesing's um, comment when she did her purpose talk. You know, things happen to you. It can make you bitter or better. And I choose to make me, let it make me better um, because it doesn't define me. And I choose to have that courage and, and to kind of rewrite my story. So if I may, I'd love to share some of those learnings. Um, this is my village, by the way, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you know, this idea of reinventing yourself. I, you know, a lot of times I went into this journey not knowing what I needed and we even had the skill set. I knew that if I wanted to survive or, or be successful that I had to change, I had to evolve, I had to make myself better. Um, and this mindset has really made it made me stronger to just jump in and figure it out um, with purpose. And it, it helped me professionally as an HR professional and it's helped me as a mother and as a daughter, a sister and a wife. Um, you know, there's this idea of um, lifting others up. You know, growing up there were a lot of people that let me down. But I, if I pause just to think about it, every corner that I turned there were people there with kindness and compassion to lift me up. And I've grown to really recognize that for when it's there or even if it's missing. If for me, that's what it's all about. You know, Jim, the HR director from Georgia Pacific, he could have just walked on by and not worry about this, you know, college, you know, uh, freshman. The Metzger certainly didn't have to bring me in and treat me as part of the family. Um, you know, it, when I first started here on the first day, that my, my, my HR leader, um, Nancy, and my teammates, I mean, they made me feel like home from day one. And it's that HR community, it's everyone here on the phone and in this room that lifts me up. And so I'm forever grateful for that. And for the people that let me down, I, you know, I don't know what they were going through. I mean, my grandfather was an orphan. I mean, I just, you don't know what people might be going through. And even though it was really tough for me and it still is today, I think back that, that people don't typically do those things or say those things to a child. And maybe they were doing the best that they can. So in a way, having compassion towards them allows me to let go. And, and that in itself lifts me up quite a bit. And so um, this last idea of a village, you know, you don't have to do it alone like me, like I thought I was doing it all alone. You can lean on people around you, you can open up, you can have conversations, share your hardships, ask for help, offer help. You know, for me when I did that, it allowed me to grow beyond my capacity, beyond what I thought, and really together we are better. So we, when we wanna thrive, we can do it together and allowing others to help us is really part of that journey. So I wanna conclude with this thought. Today you see me here, you know, still struggling some days, still, still working on it, um, still work in progress. I do truly believe that all of us, again, in this room, on the phone, that we do belong somewhere and to someone. So 
Thank you for your time. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thanks, <laughs> I don't have any slides. Thank you, Maria. I just want to, on behalf of everyone here and everybody watching, Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for lifting us up, and thank you for bringing you to us, to you to work every day, because you do make a big difference. Thank so, you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.